Hi, thank you for joining us for this talk on the future of policy enforcement, decoupled and distributed. My name is Ash Narkar. I am a software engineer at Styra, and I'm one of the maintainers of the Open Policy Agent. I care about developing software that can be readily deployed, scaled, managed, and is secure by default. In today's presentation, we'll talk about the policy enforcement problem. We we'll learn about the Open Policy Agent, look at its features and use cases. So let's get started. If you look at the cloud native landscape, it's constantly evolving. You have new projects being added every single day. It may be a new database, it may be a new API gateway, a new service mesh, and so on. And so if you're developing a system which comprises of all these different projects, you're going to have a lot of moving parts in your system. If we talk about security, specifically authorization for such a diverse system, you can imagine each of these projects written in a different programming language. Each of them have their own special way of controlling access, which may be tied to the underlying system. And what ends up happening is you have no visibility into the security posture of your diverse system. Even from a flexibility point of view, if say tomorrow you wanted to swap out your service mesh, you now have to spend both time and money to recreate those same policies to conform to your new platform. And you might say, we'll just use docs and wikis and just write these policies down somewhere and enforce them that way. That's fine until you have tens, hundreds, or even thousands of microservices, and this wiki approach is no longer sustainable. So what we need is a unified way to control access across all these diverse systems in a highly performant manner. And this was one of the motivations behind creating the open policy agent. So what is the open policy agent? OPA is an open source general purpose policy engine. When you use OPA, you are decoupling the policy enforcement from the policy decision making so your services can now offload policy decisions to OPA by executing a query. We'll understand this concept a little more, but before we do that, let's quickly talk about OPA's community. The project was started in 2016, and the goal of the project has been to unify policy enforcement across the stack. One of the earliest adopters of OPA was Netflix, and they've been using OPA for authorization over their gRPC and HTTP APIs. And companies like Chef, Medallia, Capital One, Yelp, and many, many more are using OPA in production for a variety of use cases, such as RBAC, ABAC, admission control, data protection, and so on. For those of you all that follow the CNCF, OPA is a graduated project with more than 150 contributors on Git. It has a healthy Slack community of more than 4,000 Slack members. It's been starred more than 5,000 times on GitHub, and it's integrated with more than 20 of the most famous open source projects out there, some of which we'll see later on. So this was an overview of OPA's community. Now let's try to understand how OPA actually works. So like I mentioned before, it's an open source general purpose policy engine. Imagine you have a service. Now this can be any service at all. It can be your own custom service, an API gateway, a Kubernetes admission control, API server, any service at all. 
whenever your service gets a request, it's going to ask OPA for a policy decision by executing a query. OPA is going to evaluate this query based on the policy and the data it has access to and send a decision back to your service where it gets enforced. So you can see that we have decoupled the policy enforcement from the policy decision making. The policy query itself can be any JSON value. So for example, if you're doing HTTP API authorization, this policy query could include your request path, your method, your headers, your user, anything at all. Or if you're doing Kubernetes admission control, this policy query could include the pod manifest, for example. The policy decision itself can also be any JSON value, and then it's up to your service how to interpret that decision. So this was a high-level overview of how OPA enables you to decouple the policy decision making from the policy enforcement. Now, let's look at some of OPA's features. At the core of OPA is a high-level declarative language called as Rego. And with Rego, you can write policies which are more than allow, deny, through, false, yes, no. Your policies can be strings, sets, objects, basically collection of values. So it's very expressive in terms of the policy decisions you can author. So for example, OPA can help you answer the question, is Bob allowed to access a particular field? And OPA can also help you answer the question, which fields can Bob access? So it's very flexible and very powerful in terms of the policy decisions you can write. OPA is written in Go, and it's designed to be as lightweight as possible. So all the policies and all the data you need for evaluation are stored in memory. You can think of OPA as a host local cache for your policy decisions. You can deploy OPA as a sidecar, a host level daemon. You can embed it inside your Go code as a library. And now you can also compile Rego policies down to Wasm executables and then use those to evaluate your queries and get a policy decision. OPA does not have any runtime dependencies, meaning to make a policy decision, OPA does not have to reach out to any external service or an external database. You can do that. You can, you can optionally do that. Uh, but by default, it does not need any kind of external dependencies. OPA does provide you with some management APIs that allow you to pull policy and data from a remote server. OPA also uploads all the decisions that it makes to a remote server, which you can use for offline debugging and for audit purposes. And OPA can also upload its own status, its own health to a remote server as well. Finally, along with the core policy engine, OPA provides you with a rich set of tooling to unit test, to debug your policies. OPA provides you with a unit test framework, which you can use to test your policies before you actually go and deploy them. There are integrations with IDEs like Vim, VS Code, IntelliJ, which allow you to author your policies too. And we also have a Rego Playground, which is an online interactive tool which helps you to author and share your policies. And we'll see the playground later in the presentation. So these were some of OPA's features, a high-level declarative language, multiple deployment models, management APIs for control and visibility, and a rich tooling set. So we saw this slide uh, some time ago, and I said that OPA is a general purpose policy engine. The reason for that is OPA is not 
tied to any particular data model. Meaning, as long as you give OPA some kind of structured data and you write policies that make sense for that data, OPA will give a decision back to you. And hence, it's a general purpose policy engine. Another thing here is that this is just a snapshot of all the projects OPA is integrated with. There are much more which you can find out on the OPA website. And if you'd like to contribute to OPA, you can integrate it with your favorite project and have it featured on the OPA website. And one more thing, you can take any of these integrations out of the box and without even having to write a single line of code, you can start enforcing custom policies in these systems using the open policy agent. So we highly recommend you all try that. So now let's look at some of OPA's use cases. We look at the first one around Kubernetes admission control. So for those of you all that are not familiar with admission control, it's a piece of code that intercepts requests to your Kubernetes API server before those requests are persisted into HCD. So admission control is an amazing way to enhance the security profile of your Kubernetes cluster. And now you can use OPA as an admission controller to enforce some of the policies that you see on the screen. For example, you may not want your containers to grab images from public repositories. You may want them to only grab images from like your private repository, your private registry. So you can enforce that using OPA. Or you may want your containers to specify CPU and memory limits and requests. You can enforce that with OPA as well. Or you may not want your containers to run in privileged mode. In fact, all of the pod security policies can easily be implemented using the open policy agent. So to give you an idea of how admission control works, imagine uh, you do something. And by something, I mean you do a coop cuttle create some pod. So whenever you execute this command, it's going to send out a request to OPA. And the input that OPA gets, it's this admission review object you see on the left. And this is a deeply nested structure. You can see it's a pod, it has some metadata, it has a list of containers and some other information as well. So this is the input that OPA gets. And now OPA has to make a decision, again, based on this input, and the policy and data that you've provided to OPA and send a decision back to the Kubernetes webhook. And you can see in this case, the admission response, which is the decision sent out by OPA, is not a simple Boolean yes, no. It is an object which not only tells you the decision that was made, but also explains what was that decision. In this case, bad image registry. So again, you can see the theme out here, wherein we have tried to decouple the policy enforcement, which is done by the webhook, versus the policy decision making, which is done by OPA. So you can see that decoupling happening in this example as well. What, what we'll now do is we'll see a live example of some rego code, and we can see how we can interact with the Rego Playground and how we can write some simple admission control rules. So what I have here is basically the Rego Playground. You can see it's available at play.openpolicyagent.org. You can see some good syntax highlighting for your Rego code, which makes it very easy to uh, debug and write your code as well. So the policy, you can see this is a pay, this pane to write policy. You can see there's one to provide the input and they get the output as well. So this is a very simple policy. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that every container inside your pod is specifying a CPU limit. So if you go down this policy, what we are doing is we are checking 
uh, the resource, which is a pod. We then iterate over every container inside that pod and we check if it specifies a CPU limit. And if it does not, we are going to return a violation. You can see the input like we saw on the slide. It's a deeply nested structure, which is a pod. It contains some containers. And you can see that there are two containers. One container is basically the Nginx container, which specifies the CPU and memory limit. And there's another container, which is the MySQL container, which does not specify any CPU or memory limits. And so now if I evaluate this policy, we know that there is a violation out here because the MySQL container does not specify the limit. So if I click on evaluate, I get a violation saying that the container MySQL does not provide a CPU limit, which makes sense. Now let's say you wanted to extend this policy for memory limits. So you want to say that all your containers inside your pod should specify a memory limit. Now to do that, all you have to do is take the existing policy. And let's say we again look for the same kind, which is the pod. We will iterate over the containers inside that pod specification. And instead of looking at the CPU limit, let's say we look at the memory limit. And then if it does not specify the memory limit, what we'll do is we'll just update the message to specify to say that you know the memory is missing. So there you go. So now if I have typed everything correctly, we again see in the input that we have the Nginx container specifying both CPU memory, but the MySQL container specifies nothing. So if I evaluate this policy again, you should see that there are two violations instead of one. So let's see. There you go. So we can see that there have two violations with the MySQL container, one for missing the CPU limit, the other one for missing the memory limit. And now, since you've written your first Draco policy and you're super excited, you can share this policy by clicking the Publish button and you get this beautiful link which you can use and then you can see your new policy and you can share this policy with friends and family. So in this way, in a very simple manner, you can write a very simple admission control policy that makes sure that containers specify both CPU and memory limits. So this is how you would use OPA as an admission controller to enhance the security profile of a Kubernetes cluster and enforce custom security policies. If you would like to check out the demo policy, it's at this link. Uh, so play around with the Rego Playground and share and write your policies in a very fairly easy manner. And there are a bunch of examples on the Playground which you can use to get started as well. So thank you so much for joining us for this talk on the future of policy enforcement, decoupled and distributed. If you want to learn more about the Open Policy Agent, check out the OPA website. If you have any questions, you can join us on Slack. Uh, if you have any use cases to discuss, you can discuss them on Slack as well. And check out the code on GitHub. And if you like what you see, please do start the project. Again, thank you for joining us and sharing your time with us today. Thank you.